Hello and welcome to Richcast, the flagship podcast of pointing out that Elon Musk doesn't know what a contract is, how they work, or if they exist. That's it. I'm going with it. That's that's going to be a big part of today. I just want to be clear about that. And if you need to do something else, that's fine. We're also going to talk about TVs later. So real some real classic Vergecast stuff will be here. But I'm I'm not going to shy away from knowing what a contract is because I I know. <laughs> Past the bar in two states, people. I know what a contract is, and that guy doesn't. Hi, I'm your friend, Eli. Uh, David Pierce is once again not here, which means there's literally no check on my power or authority. Although Alex Kranz is back. Welcome, Alex. Hey, I'm here, and I'm your friend who is going to sue you because I, I want money, and you said no. So, to court. It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, we have an additional Alex. Alex Heath is here. Hi. I'm I'm also not using Bing. You couldn't pay me to use it either. <laughs> Oh, yeah. We could have. I want to be clear. We could have also been the flagship podcast of You Can't Pay Me to Use Bing. <laughs> Another thing we're going to spend a lot of time on today. Uh, it, it's a big week. Lauren Finer is also here. Hey, Lauren. Hello. Uh, there's a lot of news this week. Uh, I thought it was going to be a quiet week. We we really thought it was going to be a quiet week. And then on Monday, uh, the court released a gigantic ruling in the Google search antitrust case. Finding the Google search is a monopoly. We got to talk all about that. Uh, the Assistant Attorney General for NHS, Jonathan Cantor, was on Decoder. We had just a lot to say about that case. A lot to say about Apple in relation to that case. Google is paying Apple for default placements. So we got to spend time on that. Then we're like, huh, all right, we know what's going to happen this week. Then Elon Musk filed <laughs> an X, filed a lawsuit uh, against advertisers claiming antitrust violations because they refused to advertise on X. I would say not as clear cut a victory for that case as maybe in the Google search case. We got to talk about that. Uh, we have a lightning round. There's a bunch of stuff in the lightning round to talk about, actually. And then, of course, Disney Plus is raising prices. A real, a real verge chest. Oh, and I judged a TV competition, which I thought I was going to get a chance to write about, but didn't because everyone's suing each other. I read so many PDFs this week. <laughs> Wait, you judged a TV competition? Yeah. Like the, 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 the 20th annual TV shootout. What? Yes. Like the actual this? TVs. The actual TVs. We, they, put, they put a bunch of OLEDs and micro LED TVs in a room. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went into that room with a bunch of like, like high-end Hollywood colorists and compression engineers. Uh, and it was, it was like all of them and then me <laughs> as the judge. And we, and we looked at the TVs. We had long worksheets to fill out as we watched different <laughs> like scenes of movies. And then we like rated. And I was going to write it. I was like, this was my week to finally let go of talking about the government and talk about what I love instead, which is how TVs look. And I didn't get to do a lick wow. of it. Where did the frame the, TV rank? In? The frame TV was not, uh, it did not make it to the competition. <laughs> what? Immediately yeah, like booted. It, it, it wasn't even in the mix. Like it didn't even get to the, <laughs> there were six TVs in the, in the finals and the, the frame was not among them. Um, uh, they're not really finals. They just picked the six specs TVs in the market. And then I will tell you the two brands, we'll talk about it, but the, the two brands specifically said, do not include us in this competition. <laughs> just like, no, thank you. <laughs> we'll get to it. And I'll talk about it. And I promise I'll write about it for next week. But that's what I thought I was going to do this week. Like really and truly, I thought I was going to argue with people about whether micro LED TVs can compete with OLEDs. And I didn't do that because our, our the, the sheer number of PDFs generated by the judicial branch of our government was out of control. <laughs> like, talk about a good time to buy a Books Palma. Just PDFs for days. Just forever. All right. Let's start with the Google search ruling. Um, yeah, this case has been going on since, what, 2020? It was filed under the Trump administration uh, in the sort of, like, classic Trump administration, like, I don't know, let's sue Google. Like, we're mad at them. But that uh, was actually Biden, right, that, that took it home? Yeah, and then obviously the Biden administration with, with Lena Khan and, and specifically Jonathan Cantor at the Department of Justice, who runs the antitrust division. Um, you know, Lena Khan is the chair of the FTC. Cantor runs the antitrust division at the DOJ. They have been sort of like debating, or arguing even who gets to take which antitrust enforcement action, and Google ended up at the DOJ. Lauren, you have some color, like even watching that, how do they decide who gets to do what? Yeah, so generally how it breaks down is it's somewhat based on just like the expertise of each agency. Like I think there's certain um, industries that DOJ tends to take and certain industries that FTC tends to take. And it also uh, maybe they'll consider like, is this something where we might bring in the FTC Act, um, which obviously the FTC would use um, and maybe that 
uh, feeds into the determination. But I think generally it's just based on, is this an industry that typically is a DOJ or an FTC industry? Yeah. Uh, so the, the DOJ had this one, it, again, started under the Trump administration. The Biden DOJ carried on with it. There was a trial. We covered the hell out of the trial. Eddie Q was on the stand. Tim Cook was on the stand. Nadella was on the stand talking about whether Bing could compete with Google. Was this the, the trial where they, like, just wouldn't let us see a lot of it? It was a lot of it was yes. closed off. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there was a period where the judge... Um, I think it was a result of some of the third parties in the cases that didn't want, you know, their business information just aired out in front of the press and the public um, kind of pushed for, um, you know, more behind closed doors elements of the trial. And the judge um, conceded to a lot of that in the beginning. And then there was a lot of pushback from the press and it became a bit more open. So, yes, that was this trial. Yeah. Uh, and it, like the judge was like, well, I believe Google when they say these are trade secrets. And there was a lot of criticism. Lauren, from what I understand, the judge took the criticism to heart. Like he was pretty stung by it. And then he opened up, and we got to cover more of it. We did we did cover the trial on an ongoing basis. And then it was pretty quiet while he was writing this opinion, which is 286 <laughs> pages long. He was writing a book. It, yeah. it, is a, it is a book about search. Yeah, it was interesting because I was just looking back at my stories from the days of the closing arguments in May. And I remember walking away from that thinking, like, you know, he kind of was holding his cards close to the chest, um, but, you know, made a few comments that seemed to dig at Google. Um, but reading it back now, having seen the opinion, I can see like, oh, he really was kind of probably already drafting this and thinking about a lot of these sections um, of the opinion even back then. Yeah. So the, the, the ruling in the case 286 pages. Yesterday, I said to Sarah Jong, I thought it was readable. And she was like, you don't, you don't know what readable means. That's it is very long. You can read it. <laughs> it's not like, at one point there, he's talking about how uh, ad auctions work and there's literally like mathematical formula in it. It's, there, there's a lot in 286 pages, but uh, the main holdings are Google search is a monopoly. And he found that there's a market for general search engines. Uh, Alex, you and I have talked about this uh, whenever there's antitrust cases, the tech companies try to argue that the markets don't exist. Like Facebook yeah. has basically held off an antitrust action by insisting that there's no such thing as a market for social networks. And Facebook <laughs> is not in it, even if there was. And that has worked until kind of now when the judge found, okay, general search engines are a thing. People understand what they are as distinct from TikTok search or whatever. So he found general search is a market and Google is the only competitor. And there's a line in there. He's like, these are Fortune 500 companies, Apple and whoever else, and they can only turn to Google. There's nowhere else for them to go. I really like the way that he defined that. It seemed like it was actually the clearer way to say it, which is just a general search engine encompasses a lot of the web. It's not a silo like TikTok. TikTok, you can... I mean, I've used TikTok for search to find things that I'm looking at, but it's only TikTok content. And I thought the way he just kind of clearly defined general search as being an aggregation of a lot of different sources of content was helpful. Even like following the trial, not as in the weeds as Lauren, but like I, the definition stuff was always pretty wonky to me, how they were defining different corners of search. And I thought he actually did a pretty good job in the opinion, the final ruling here, laying it out. Oh, yeah. I that was something that during the closing arguments, I remember uh, the judge, it, I think Google was trying to make the case that, you know, Amazon is a potential competitor and all these other things. And I remember the judge saying something along the lines of like, well, you know, it, Amazon doesn't like index the web. Like it is a different <laughs> thing. So yeah. I think that's something that he really took to heart. Uh, he points out that um, he had expert witnesses in the case who uh, testified that the biggest advertisers on Google and Bing are vertical search engines. So mm. like flight search engines or travel search engines or whatever, they advertise a lot and Google because that's where the audience for their searches are. And he's like, well, this is, they're obviously not substitutes. Like if you're, if you're trying to acquire audience for your vertical search engine and travel or whatever on Google, Google is obviously not substituted for that. So he, he lays out this case. And, you know, if you want to get into the nitty gritty legal analysis of it, you should just listen to Decoder with Cantor because we got into it. And part of it is understanding how the government is getting better at defining these markets because this is where they have gotten tripped up and where the tech companies have really won uh, and pushed off a lot of this enforcement for years by just by just tying these like deep philosophical knots of like, what is it even the market that Google is in? Even in this case, uh, this is one of the funniest 
counter arguments that Google made. They said that Google is not in the market for search engines. It's in the market for answering queries. Just sure. like broadly, just like if you have a question, that's the thing that Google does. Yeah. And like, they're like, every place you might answer a question is a place that competes with Google. And the judge was like, no, like that's not true. If you search Amazon, you only get products. You don't get answers to questions. Google is this like very general search engine. So the, the government won there. They said it was a search engine. And they said that they're anti-competitively protecting the monopoly in search that they have with the deals with Apple, which we should talk about at length. Um, so Apple pays Google... $20 billion a year on the order of $20 billion a year to be the default search provider on iOS and the Mac and other Apple products. Uh, there are some conditions, which are the thing that make those deals anti-competitive. It's not just the money. We should talk about those. And then they found that there's a monopoly for search text ads, uh, which is just the text ads in search, not general search ads, because there you do have competition from TikTok and Amazon and all this other stuff. But search text ads, the ones that show up on the search engine results page, the judge said, hey, there's a monopoly here, and Google has acted anti-competitively. And this is, I think, the shadiest part of the whole trial. Uh, Google just slowly raises the prices of those ads without considering what competitors might do or where rivals might go, and they hide those price increases in the auctions. Well, uh, what the judge said, like, that was why he found that to be a monopoly, right, was because they just didn't have to care about anyone else, and they could just raise prices whenever. And he's yeah, like, yeah, the, that's just a monopoly, guys. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, he did this in, in, in both in the advertising part and in the search engine part, where he pointed out Google does stuff and it doesn't care that people might leave, <laughs> uh, which is, as we have noted on the show many times, like, the most essential truth of the Google experience right now is, like, boy, you just blow stuff up, you cancel stuff, you shut it down, you make it worse, and there's nowhere else to go. Um, and Google doesn't seem to care. Uh, and the judge pointed out, he was like, this is only a firm with monopoly power can get away with some of the stuff that they do, including raising prices by making it appear that the auctions, you know, when you buy an ad on Google search, you like buy a keyword, you buy like airline flights or whatever keyword, hotels. Yeah. These are like hotly contested keywords. You want to put advertising around those keywords in search. And so Google is raising the prices of those auctions making it appear as though it's like noisy, like there's more demand or it's fluctuating, but really over time, it's just raising the price. And that the judge found was that that was evidence of monopoly behavior and also just like wrong, right? So this, this is a huge decision. There's stuff where they didn't, the government didn't win. There's no monopoly in like, um, there's no monopoly in general search advertising. The Google didn't get sanctioned for the way it treats its like ad tech stack, which you probably know is called DoubleClick and now has another name. Uh, and then Google deleted a lot of its chat history and the government wanted sanctions for that. And then Google deleted a lot of internal records and the government wanted sanctions for that. And I didn't get that. So that's all cast aside. But the main ones, the important ones are Google search is a monopoly. Google's acting anti-competitively. Google text ads are a monopoly. Google is raising the prices anti-competitively. Those, that's just, it just feels like a huge deal. Uh, yeah. Cantor told me this case goes on the Mount Rushmore of antitrust decisions, uh, well, which you, you, implies there's a Mount Rushmore of antitrust decisions. Like, I want to talk about a lot of the Apple stuff here, but you talked to Cantor. Did he explain what they're going to do next? Did he, did he say, oh, yeah, we're going to get him for this? Oh, so this is, uh, yeah, this is important to note. Lauren, I'm, I'm curious if you've heard anything here, but the, the trial is what's called a bifurcated trial. Mm -hmm. So there's this part, which is, did you do it and is it wrong? Yes, Google search monopoly. <laughs> then there's what's called the remedies phase, where the court lays out a process for how it will basically hold a second trial, uh, where they will figure out what the punishment is and how they will fix it. And that could be anything. Um, the government could ask for anything. The court could impose anything. It could be fines. Uh, it could be structural. That's breaking up Google. It could be behavioral. In other cases, like, you know, there's like oversight of a company's behavior to make sure it doesn't do the bad thing again. All of, they're all kind of all on the table, and uh, Cantor just. I mean, like, he's a government lawyer. I was like, answer the question. He's like, I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> like, very directly, very charmingly, he was like, I'm super not answering your question. Um, but you can you can look back to history. Um, you know, the Microsoft case comes up over and over again in this, and that was like a lengthy remedies phase, also a bifurcated trial. They negotiated a settlement. Then there was a second trial to see if the settlement was fair, and then Microsoft was under the microscope uh, with oversight for a long time to make sure it, it didn't do a bunch of Microsoft stuff. You can you can see that potentially happening in here. Yeah. 
Lauren, did you get any sense from like, I guess they're in DC of people and how they're, how they're going to react to it, what kind of punishments they might want to do? Seeing as Cantor was like refusing to give Neil any of the good stuff. <laughs> he was just like, nah. Yeah. I mean, I think that I, I know that a lot of the rivals, um, to Google who have been, you know, really cheering on this case from the DOJ side, they, you know, I think they're really cheering this decision, but at the same time are holding back a little bit because they know that what really matters here is what Google is made to do to respond to the finding of liability. So I think, you know, there is a little bit of hesitance that, you know, maybe there's going to be some sort of remedy that doesn't fully fix the problems, you know, maybe something like a search screen that we've seen in Europe that like doesn't really seem to do too much. Um, so I think there's just a feeling of like, all right, we're really happy about this, but also we know it's not done yet. Yeah. We should note Google has already said it's going to appeal the ruling. The statement from president of global affairs, Kent Walker is, uh, it's actually pretty funny. It says this decision recognizes that Google offers the best search engine, but concludes we shouldn't be allowed to make it easily available. <laughs> it's, he's basically saying oh, this is nonsensical. I don't know if that is what the decision actually says. Um, it is true the decision says over and over again, Google is the best search engine, but then is like, it's also the only one. Like, <laughs> I think it's also that, you know, I think the judge bought into this argument that the DOJ was making that, like, there's kind of this flywheel effect where, like, Google, you know, it gets all these defaults, like, gets all these people to use its platform and, you know, make all these queries. And then it has all this really good data. And then it uses that data to uh, just make the search engine better and monetize that. And so I think, you know, he's saying, yeah, it it is a really good product, but that's also because of um, these exclusive contracts that have gotten it to that place. Which like the, I think maybe you pointed this out, Neil, or maybe it was Sarah Jong online, that Apple is going to have to like, like Apple could have taken that $20 billion it gives Google every time and gone and made its own competitive search engine for less of than that. And that kind of like factored into the judge's reasoning. Yeah, is we should right? really we should generally talk about Apple, but yeah, let's talk you know, about Google Apple. pays Apple twenty billion dollars a year, and Google has also internally estimated that for Apple to build a search engine will cost Apple twenty billion dollars. Right. Hmm. So there's only so many companies that can compete with Google. One of them is Apple. One of them, and, and you know, and there's like lots of reasons, for, and there's lots of reasons for that. One of them, the most important one, is that Apple can set the default on an iPhone, so it can collect all of this data, and like a huge percentage of Google's queries for search come from default placements. Right, right. it's like fifty percent of all Google search queries come from default placements on mobile or desktop, um, whether it's Android phones or iPhones or whatever. So. Apple has a massive share of those default placements, particularly on mobile. And so it could build a search engine. It can compete because it has all that. And Google pays the money to keep them from doing it. Uh, And inside of that services agreement, it also puts in conditions that Apple agrees not to make things that look like search better at search. (laughs) <laughs> so Siri can't get better. Like the, I think the agreement says it can't get better than it is today, or it like can't be meaningfully improved faster than it is today. Spotlight search can't get better. Um, there's some documents that are, you know, as part of the exhibits, Apple considered putting some advertising into spotlight search on the iPhone. And they just like, well, we got to talk to Google about that, but we don't want to renegotiate this Google deal. I guess we won't do that. And you can just see them. They're just held back by the existence of this deal and its conditions with Google. Like, We've asked a million times, why doesn't Apple just build a search engine? And the answer is $20 billion a year. Yep. That's just fully the answer. And that's actually the thing that's anti-competitive, not the default placement, right? Not buying the default. It's the conditions that say you, can, you also cannot compete with us. But Apple doesn't want to, right? Like, like they said, no, we don't want to use Bing. We don't want to put something so else in. One of the absolute funniest conditions of the agreement with Google is that Apple is required to defend the deal against regulatory actions. <laughs> so like, yep, Apple said a bunch of stuff in this trial. 
<laughs> but they are legally obligated because of their contract with Google to co-defend the deal in the face of regulatory efforts. That's not shady. That's that's totally normal way <laughs> it's to do good. business. It's fine. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's true that Apple says they don't want to, they don't need to. Apple repeatedly said that Google is the best. There are some incredible quotes here. Uh, Eddie Q testified. Uh, they said, would you ever use Bing? And he said, there's no price Microsoft could pay to make us set Bing as the default. <laughs> and then he said, they could give us the whole thing for free. They could give us the company and we wouldn't use Bing. <laughs> like Microsoft, like, you could just have Microsoft. And he's like, no, Google is the best. And it's like, maybe you believe that, but maybe you have a contract that says you have to say it. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Like if, if you rolled up to Tim Cook and you're like, here's what we get, Microsoft. Like, I feel like he'd be like, we should talk. <laughs> I mean, Bing is... <laughs> notoriously awful. Maybe just like Eddie was trying to like find some good flight deals. Obviously he has to say that. Um, I think it's interesting that this contract was also done in 2016. So Apple and the, the most recent search contract between Apple and Google, which means that they knew in 2016 that this deal looked bad. And they put a clause in saying they both needed to defend themselves against regulators. That's just a massive red flag. I don't know about you guys. Um, I always felt like Google was going to lose this case just because of how mafia-like this arrangement has been. And the problem with Google's core argument at a very high level is this inherent contradiction of their argument was, we're winning because we're the best. We're the best search engine, right? That was their at the highest level legal argument. But then you're also paying a lot of money to win. Yeah. So what is it? Is it actually because you're the best or because you're paying money? And Google was never able to address that contradiction because I think they know that this contract is anti-competitive. I think all sides know this. And I don't think it started that way. Like, I don't think it's an over-exaggeration either to say that this contract has shaped Silicon Valley maybe more than any other contract mm -hmm. uh, between two companies in the sense of how Google and Apple grew together and have been kind of weirdly joined at the hip um, since, you know, I, the iPhone with Steve Jobs and Eric Schmidt uh, coming on stage together. And they've kind of let each other grow um, and not you know, there hasn't been a turf war because of this very lucrative deal. So you've got things like Apple uses Google Cloud uh, a lot. Um, we found out that Apple Intelligence was trained exclusively on Google's TPUs instead of NVIDIA hardware. Uh, Google helps serve advertising through Apple's uh, integrated iOS placements that's been happening for years. They've just like become very interjoined in a way that, um, yeah, Eddie could say, you know, we, <laughs> we're not going to like do this for the whole company, but it's also like, that's, that's because they kind of already are doing this with, <laughs> <laughs> with Google. Like, so they really they, did just kind of carve out and say like, okay, you get this side. I mean, not on paper, but they really did just kind yeah. of carve things out and say, okay, you get search. We're going to take phones. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, I think there's like teams inside of Google who, who do not know that. Anyone yeah. Else, yeah. The like, pixel teams like, what? Uh, but you know, it's, it's fascinating. The, the phone piece is really interesting, right? Because obviously Android exists and, I agree with you, Alex. I think the contract with Google has shaped a lot of things. I agree with you, Alex. I think that the Apple-Google contract in particular has shaped a lot of things. and It's like a black hole. It's like dis distorted the fabric of tech space-time around it for a long time. But Google has these same deals with tons of other companies. It has these deals with carriers. It has T-Mobile and AT&T and Verizon all have similar default placement deals because, you know, the carriers provision apps and services on the phones they sell. And Google knows that's like a very powerful mechanism of distribution. And if they didn't pay, Microsoft would. And then Microsoft would have slightly more distribution. There's a study in the case, uh, the, the judge cites from inside of Google. It's very small. I'm going to warn you now, the sample size is tiny. It's like 26 people. But Google did a study of 26 people, and they found that half of them did not know when Google was switched out for Bing on their iPhones. They just, like, didn't notice because no one notices. That seems and, real. Right. And, like, these defaults are super powerful. The government, uh, Cantor told me, he's like, the, the, the thing we did for the first time in any antitrust case is we put a behavioral scientist on the stand to point out that no one changes the defaults and habits are powerful and the, and the judge bought it. Like he comes back to the testimony from this behavioral scientist several times. At one point, I think this is like the most Verge thing ever. Uh, you might recall that Verizon owned Yahoo. 
<laughs> they did. Minute. That was a, <laughs> it's a real thing that happened inside of a company called Oath that they made that combined Yahoo with AOL. This isn't important except to say, like, The Verge was born out of AOL's bullshit. <laughs> so, like, it's very personal to me that Verizon made Oath at one point. Um, but Verizon owned Yahoo, and it wanted to preload Yahoo Search on its phones. And they looked at the opportunity cost of doing that and how much it would work, how much it would cost and what it would take. And they looked at the check from Google, and they picked the check from Google. <laughs> right? They took their own product that they had bought, and they're like, we could make this good. But putting it in front of more people and getting that clickstream data and making the search engine better, or we could just take Google's money. And Google's like, what if it was more money? And then Verizon caved and they flipped Yahoo. And you're like, well, why, why didn't anyone ever try with Yahoo? It's because Google just made sure it couldn't get the distribution. Uh, also very Verchast, one of my favorite parts of this whole decision, there's a lengthy conversation about bloatware and Android phones. Um, and I don't know if I believe this, but there's all this evidence mm -hmm. that people won't accept three browsers on their phones or three w search widgets, but they will take two because Samsung has two, right? So like, there's like internal Google emails and evidence and like meeting notes where they're like, we're not so worried that our deal with Samsung for distribution, where there's our browser and Samsung's browser is under threat from Microsoft because no one would ever accept three browsers. And it's like, I don't know, man. I feel like Samsung's like one minute away from doing three browsers. <laughs> Samsung is 100%. Is it Samsung's going to do like four different browsers. Yeah, it's like we're very close. And like no one, they're like, absolutely not. Two search widgets on the home screen? Heaven forbid. And it's like, I don't know. Have you met these carriers? Yeah. Like if not for your exclusivity contracts, like they would put two search widgets on the home screen. Like I, I think they're they minutes just, away from doing this. They just forgot bloatware. They just like forgot how bloaty phones were before Apple. And so along. there's a lengthy discussion of bloatware in this decision and how Google sort of like used the threat of bloatware <laughs> to, to make sure they were an exclusive <laughs> provider of search on, on these devices. And you just see it up and down the stack. They they find their angles to make sure there isn't competition and they press their advantage on those angles. And I, to me it's well, that's why we don't have other search engines. Like, there's Bing, and Bing just isn't good enough. And, like, the judge basically says Bing isn't good enough. Apple maybe has to, required to say it, says Bing isn't good enough. Google's out there running benchmarks saying Bing isn't good enough. And then sort of knowingly making their product worse. And it's fine. What was the number? There was one number in the in the decision that was like it would take Bing seventeen years to get the same amount of click data that Google gets in a day or something. So, basically, in this opinion, the judge says that thirteen months of user data acquired by Google is equivalent to over seventeen years of data on Bing. <laughs> right, that's and that's incredible. like the amount of the amount of use Google gets in thirteen months is it would take Bing seventeen years. <laughs> <laughs> and all of that feeds back into the ranking model. It's like a really interesting thing uh, in this opinion is the stuff he dismisses, right? He says, TikTok is not a competitor to Google search. And then he's like, I know you all want me to talk about AI and how AI might like dethrone Google search, but we're not there yet. It hasn't happened yet. I don't see it. And I've got all this evidence and testimony from Google's own people saying they need the user data even when they try the AI tools. Even when well, they, Google puts its AI models up to make the search results, it's the click data that actually helps them refine the search. They need the uh, feedback loop, right? Yeah. And this is what I hear talking to like Meta and other companies. Like they really think that the people who win at large scale network effects businesses like this just have the feedback loop. And AI search, if it just gives you the answer, uh, you're not learning a lot about, is the answer good? Um, how can we improve it? Because you don't have an interface where people are browsing, clicking the links, going from pages. And yeah, it's smart of Google. I, th you know, they recognized early that search was a network effects business, uh, an aggregator business, and they went out and bought all kinds of distribution. They did Android purely to get Google search out there on phones. They realized they didn't own a phone, so they made an, they bought an OS and scaled it and did all these like funny business um, you know, deals to basically bundle. And this is like this is a tale as old of as time. I mean, Microsoft will get into this, I'm sure. Microsoft 20 years ago got its hand slapped by the DOJ for doing almost the exact same thing. 
um, and the characters that come up in this case have a fascinating background in that case. Like Kent Walker, who's running legal at Google, was the general counsel for Netscape during the Microsoft <laughs> antitrust trial. Um, like he he understands, like he understands yeah. bundling and what it does to the smaller players. Uh, you can't see this if you're listening to this, but I'm wearing a Microsoft logo shirt from the early <laughs> from 2000s the trial. in honor yeah, of this. Um, so yeah, I just find it interesting that like, if you look back at the last time a case like this was brought was Microsoft and Microsoft was so dominant, so ascendant. And the question was, will Microsoft control the consumer and point to the internet, right? And now 20 years later, as a result of that decision, Microsoft didn't get broken up, but it changed a lot as a result. Um, we've got Eddie Q in court saying, you couldn't give me all of Microsoft to use Bing, <laughs> right? And it's like, what does that mean for Google in 20 years? Yeah. Like it, it, that's what these cases do. And this is why it's such a big deal long-term. So this is what Cantor said to me on Decoder. Again, I won't get too into the weeds and legal stuff, but his takeaway, his big consumery takeaway was this case is a continuation of the Microsoft case. The opinion itself, the judge makes endless references to the Microsoft opinion. He says, I'm using the same analytical framework as the Microsoft case. Um, and Cantor's point to me was that case was about the application model moving from Windows to the web which it definitely did. Now, whether or not you want to ascribe that to antitrust action or not, a lot of people have a lot of arguments. But a thing that really happened is we run apps and web browsers now and not natively on Intel processors on Windows. Like, we just run web apps. We're making this podcast and web app right now, a very cranky web app, I would add, that only runs in Chrome. There's your antitrust problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, the application model moved to the web. It allowed a company like Google to exist because Microsoft wasn't able to bundle Internet Explorer and force out other browsers. So you had browser competition, which meant you had application model competition, on and on and on, and now you get to Google. And now the government has cases against not only Google, but also Apple, basically alleging the same thing. And Cantor's like, we have to make sure the next generation of applications is allowed to exist. And it's these moments when everyone can see the change that the incumbents try to crush the, in, the insurgent models. And he, his point is Google is trying to do that potentially with AI search. They see it coming, so they're trying to lock down their advantage and make sure no one else gets distribution and right. they can capture that market. And he thinks Apple is trying to do that on the iPhone too. I don't know if they're going to win the Apple case, but that's the sort of his theory of the situation is a direct continuation from Microsoft. The Microsoft case is generally interesting because, you know, it's been 20, they, they started that investigation in 1990 and they reached resolution in what, 2001? So that yeah. took a long time. Um, and, you know, Bill Gates is out there being like, yeah, that distracted me so I didn't do smartphones. And it's like, yeah, like that's one way of thinking about it, but you also made Windows Phone, which was bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he likes to say like he's just like it distracted me it's like no it didn't distract you that much because you made a phone you just made a crummy phone and you don't want people to know talk about it well yeah. it, it makes these companies especially at this scale just super skittish right and you're and i do think there is an argument that microsoft missed the mobile wave and didn't do it right because it was skittish because it was on it was on its back foot it was uh subsumed by litigation and regulatory response internally and it's hard to not see that maybe playing out with Google here. And you can see Google already reacting this way in that, like, they're in the way that they fake bought at Character AI last week, for example, um, which is totally wild. It came out after the Vergecast last week. I'll just quickly recap it. They basically bought this AI company without doing it, and they paid all the investors and the employees as if they bought the company, but they only took the AI people and are leaving <laughs> the husk, the flaming husk of what they left behind um, and saying good luck. <laughs> but uh, not a not a m and event because they didn't buy equity. Um, but they're doing deals like this because they already feel this antitrust scrutiny, and they're not able to take the kind of big swings that they took to get to where they are now, which is buying YouTube, buying DoubleClick, buying these things that fortified their monopoly. Um, and there's a really strong argument to be made that in the same way this kept Microsoft from being able to be so aggressive in the early 2000s, that could happen again with Google here. Okay, but here's a counter argument to that. Microsoft was distracted and lost in compliance efforts. And I don't know, Bill Gates was drinking tequila and screaming at the moon about the Department of Justice or whatever he was doing instead of inventing the iPhone. Jumping over chairs. Uh, do you believe that? Fine. Well, maybe you believe that's 100% true. Uh, Google exists. Apple was allowed to be resurgent because they put out the iMac 
with a web browser on it. Like the the iMac running OS nine when it came out was not like there's a suite of great OS nine applications for the Mac. It was this is the computer that's easiest to get on the web with. That's how they marketed it. Because the web was the application environment, it was a thing everybody wanted. It wasn't a bunch of weird Intel C D ROM Windows applications or whatever was happening before. And Carta was not the thing, right? It was the web. <laughs> and that worked. Like, I, here we are in 2024, and we're like, Apple and Google are dominant companies because Microsoft was f forced or coerced or distracted away from foreclosing that competition. And it's pretty hard. Like, you can look at that in hindsight, and I promise you a bunch of old head VCs and investors will like, and ex-Microsoft executives in particular will litigate and relitigate whether it actually happened or whether Apple was just better or whatever. But it is true that Microsoft was turned away and the web was allowed to be dominant and the dominance of the web is what enabled the iMac to be successful and now we're here with the iPhone, right? Like, that's yep. the line. Yeah, Great. I think that's what a lot of advocates for antitrust enforcement would say is just like, yeah, maybe, you know, with Microsoft, we saw Microsoft bog down and um, its legal woes for a while. But, you know, what would have been a bad outcome was like never getting the rise of Apple and Google in the first place, never getting those products. Not that Microsoft wasn't the one to invent those. Well and also, Microsoft is doing just yeah, they fine. figured it out. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, like it forced them to be competitive. It forced them to think. That's why yeah. they, they they invested in Azure and and yeah. they built up this this huge uh, cloud computing business. Yeah, like, Microsoft is uh, Nadell is like, I want to make a dance. Like, yeah, he's like, like, like having a good time in his life. Like competition is in fact good, and when these companies get so big that they don't compete. We do see things like this, and I'm I'm not just saying that because I just bought a car with Google inside, and it's hot garbage, and I can really feel <laughs> how their their monopoly oh is affecting me personally. But you do feel it, like everybody oh, you feel feels it. it. Oh, you yeah. feel it. Google's stock price in the last five years is up 177. percent Do we feel like search has gotten 177 percent better in the last Worse. five years? It's actually it's no. They, the they've just direction. canceled 177 percent of their products. <laughs> That's all they've done. They've just they. They've just end of life 177% of the things they invented. Um, but I think this is the part that's really hard. And I, you know, you couldn't have guaranteed in 2001 that Apple would be resurgent or that Google would come to be dominant on the web, that they, they're dominant. And I think it's really hard to sit here in 2024 and predict that OpenAI will now have a chance to become the next Google. OpenAI, which I will remind everyone, Microsoft owns 51%. Um, <laughs> you, 49, can't you can't predict that... <laughs> It's 49. Uh, you can't predict that Microsoft will, uh, or you can't predict that TikTok will actually turn into a search engine because it has some designs and like larger search applications Who that might get banned. Like there might be some startup that, you know, next year is going to take off and grow at the scale. It's really hard to make the forward looking argument, especially when we don't know what the remedy is going to be, right? Yeah. If the government shows up and says, break up Google. And the only way to fix this is to I don't know, break up YouTube and Google. And the first thing YouTube is going to do is build a general search engine because it's obvious that that's what they should do. And the first thing newly broken up Google will do is build a video platform because it's all, like, sure. But is that what they're going to ask for? We don't know. Lauren, just yeah, gonna ask I, I was going to ask Lauren this. Do we think the DOJ actually wants to break up Google? I think they actually just want Google to not be able to spend $30 billion a year buying their distribution. I mean, I would. I think the strongest signal we have is just the statements from Cantor himself about how he thinks about remedies generally, and that's that he prefers structural remedies, aka breakups. And so, I think how how sweeping will that structural remedy be that they ask for? I don't know, but and you know, will they? Is there a chance that they decide it's better to go with a behavioral remedy, aka? like ask them to stop doing something, ask them to stop putting certain terms in their contracts. Maybe they think that's more appropriate in this case. Um, but I think we have to seriously consider that, you know, th this structural remedies are something that Jonathan Cantor tends to like. Yeah, well, sure. I guess my point is like negotiating one on one is you always ask for more than you know you're going to get. I think they give me the whole company. Yeah. Give me all of yeah. Microsoft. They will obviously ask to break up Google. I think in Cantor's heart of hearts, he would actually be okay if 
all that came out of this case was what happened in the Microsoft case, which is the government went for a breakup. They didn't get it. But Microsoft was foreclosed from doing these bundling anti-competitive contracts for distribution. I have to think the DOJ would be happy with that. And that would be just as, I think, impactful on all of tech if Google just can't buy out its distribution. But but would it? Yeah, I think so. Because I think... Like how if you think of okay, how do they do that? How do they change that? Well, then first thing, how do you change it on the iPhone? How do you change what that default is? Because there's always a default. Well, so I, one uh, inside of that question, I think is a very weird thing, which so inside of that question, I think is a, a, a hard problem to grapple with, which is right now Apple collects twenty billion dollars here from Google. Yeah. If it can no longer collect that money, will it spend money to make its own search product? I, it's like, not that's on weird, Bing. right? It's yeah. It's not going to take the money from Bing, as we know. Eddie Q won't. There's no sum. He's unbuyable. <laughs> His integrity is unimpeachable <laughs> by Bing specifically. Uh, but you know, uh, Cantor told me uh, that he thinks the AI turn is a big inflection point, and he wants the remedy to be forward looking. Mm. Right? He's not like he's like I can't fix 15 years of anti-competitive behavior. I need to make it so the future is, has competition in it. So if you prevent the money, if you prevent the $20 billion from going to Apple, does Apple invest more in Apple intelligence? Does it start answering more questions directly? Does it make, you know, th- right now it's OpenAI is the, the sort of general search product built into Apple intelligence, but we know they're going to make a deal with Google too. Maybe there's more choices there, right? And like Apple's going to, to, to more providers. And you can see like maybe that creates a different outcome. Like I, for me, it's like, is it going to make Siri better? I think we're underestimating the power of money and the power of when you're so yes, it's twenty billion, but it's actually more than that. It's it's a meaningful percent of Apple's profit margin because the Google right. check is a hundred percent margin. So when you subtract the Google money, Apple services business, which is the narrative for the future growth of the stock that Tim Cook has been spending for ten years, collapsed by a quarter. It's significant, and I think we're underestimating the just capitalistic um, inherent drivers here of when you are not getting a check to not do something anymore, you may go do that thing. Um, (laughs) And for the last, you know, 10 years, Apple has been getting paid an ungodly amount of money to just like, don't look over there. Yeah. Hey, Liam, just to end on this, we've talked a lot about the the decision and the mechanics of Apple and what might happen next. Heath, you're, you know, you're sourced inside all these companies. What's the vibe inside of Google right now? Are they afraid? Are they worried? Are they watching their stock price? Like, what's happening? (laughs) They're always watching the stock price. (laughs) Um, I think that what will really start to change things is when we get closer into this remedy phase and there's an actual sense of... uh, Is it a breakup? Is it Apple can no longer, uh, you know just be our default? Do we have to like make this a fair playing field? Do we have to open up our distribution lanes? We can't bundle uh, Android and search. When that stuff starts becoming more concretely um, explained, which Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like will be this fall. This is happening pretty soon, right? So I would say by this fall, what will happen if the Microsoft case is any Uh, indication is there will be a ton of scrambling inside Google. There'll be a whole division spun up to address this, whatever structural changes they need to make should they lose this on appeal. Um, And it's going to be messy because it's, it's hard to, I've been thinking about this, like who does this hurt more in the short term, Apple or Google? Uh, Because Apple gets the money, which will hurt its stock price. uh, But Google's not going to have its distribution which will also hurt its stock price. Um, I have to think that Apple already has the scenarios mapped out of what it will do should it lose this case. The vibe I've gotten inside Google is that they've actually been kind of gritting their teeth and just praying that this won't happen, Um, which was the Microsoft approach 20 years ago. Um, Microsoft had other businesses, though. I just well, want to point Google, this out. No, Google does, too. Like Google Cloud is huge. Like Google, But not YouTube huge compared huge. to search. I think YouTube and Google Cloud together are as big as search, if not bigger. Neela, you um, don't think the Pixel is going to come around? <laughs> XR is about to like blow us all away. I'm just saying Google has all of its eggs are in this basket. Well, all of its eggs are in Gemini. 
And I yeah. think, you know, we saw this this week with like Gemini in the new Nest lineup, right? They are putting Gemini everywhere. I thought it was really interesting how we were at IO and Gemini was such a big part of the Pixel Android experience and it's only going to be on Pixel. I think they really are betting on Gemini being the thing that kind of makes them uh, something that consumers willingly pick again um, because they didn't have to worry about this for the last 10 years with search. <laughs> um, and Gemini for them has to work as a thing that makes people interested in Google as an actual innovator again. And I think that is their big bet to survive this change should they lose the Apple deal. Yeah. All right. We'll see. We, again, we're not at the remedies phase yet. If you want to read all 286 pages of the opinion, it's, it, we'll put a link in the show notes. And if you want a deep dive onto like the legal mechanics of it, uh, we'll link to that episode of Dakota with Jonathan Cantor because he we got very nerdy. At one point, I think he was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Stop it. Um, uh, but we'll link all that in the show notes. We got to take a break. We're, we're, we're well on our way to going over already. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. I apologize because we have to talk about another court case. We're going to keep this one short because it's stupid. <laughs> I, I feel very confident in saying that this case is stupid. Uh, uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, has filed an antitrust lawsuit against the World Federation of Advertisers, a number of giant advertising X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, has filed an antitrust lawsuit against the World Federation of Advertisers, which is a marketing trade association, and a bunch of big companies like Unilever and Mars, which makes candy bars, uh, for, uh, quote, withholding revenue. <laughs> they don't advertise on <laughs> Keith, can you quickly? I can't even get through. Can you quickly explain what's going on here? Um, X, what's really going on is that X's revenue has collapsed under Elon Musk um, in North America. I think the Times recently, or recently reported it's collapsed by more than 50% year over year. Um, and I think there's a lot of pressure on Linda Yaccarino, the CEO ish of X, to find revenue. And Elon. Uh, Hates this trade group um, and probably said we just need to sue them like he did with OpenAI, et cetera. Um, and it's a trade group. So, you know, it's not the companies that that spend the money. It's a it's a thing that it's an entity that is a middleman that helps them decide how to spend the money. But the idea that any trade group has the ability to keep Unilever from <laughs> <laughs> spending on a platform is shows a fundamental misunderstanding of the advertising ecosystem. Um, well, isn't yeah. X also a member of the... And they are a member, website? and they tweeted that they were proud to be a member last month. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, Linda Yaccarino posted a very... Um, I'm just going to say hostage video hostage. hostage. Well, she's not a hostage. No, no, no. She's not she's a just hostage. bad That's at true. making videos. Well, it could have been AI. I don't know. The, the yeah. necklace saying mama and then free speech makes me think it wasn't AI. No, these are all choices um, she made in her dumb bubble where people think that shit's cool. Mama There's nothing speech. about her. That's a hostage or unwitting. <laughs> Like we have, I, she was at code last year. We saw her. She, like she's real. She's doing this because she <laughs> wants to. Yes, uh, I think so. I think there's a big part of where people at X. This is just from like my sources and Kylie's. Like, really feel the fading of their relevance as a company. It was really funny. Like Linda held an all hands after filing this lawsuit that our Kylie Robinson was was uh, getting info from from a source, and. Um, <laughs> When journalists started like posting what was happening to this all hands, she said in the all hands, like, look, this shows that we're important, which I think <laughs> is just like a sign of the vibe, which is like X is thrashing around trying to be important. And I think litigation is a very classic Elon way of feeling important. Um, and this is also has like. It has Jim Jordan wrapped up in it. Um, Lauren, I, I just, I, this makes me just want to like roll yeah, my eyes. Yeah, because he was upset, right? Like he, he did a thing last year. Yeah, Lauren, can you explain the the Republican Congress Jim Jordan aspect of this? Because it's <laughs> it's it's like brain worms, but it we, it's probably important <laughs> to explain. They are important brain worms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, well, oh yeah, I forgot that Jim Jordan did send this letter to companies in this group asking about this boycott. 
Um, and, you know, this is like the kind of thing that Jim Jordan likes to get involved in. You know, he did a whole thing around the, you know, what he has termed like censorship or collusion between the Biden administration and um, and tech companies. Um, so I think this is, you know, right in that sweet spot of like X being this like free speech platform in his eyes that's being harmed by, you know, this group of other corporate entities. Um, so I think like this is just like right in that kind of wheelhouse. And I think okay, the- I just want to say something very clearly. And look, I know I went to law school. I'm not saying I'm an expert on every aspect of the law. I just know this one thing. Wait, you went to law school? There's what? no constitutional duty to spend money on advertising. <laughs> you don't have to do it. And in fact, most of our speech law like depends on the functioning of a market, right? We're like, actually, like, you know, there's a cliche phrases, like the cure for bad speech is more speech that we use. We're like, oh, we'll just like shovel more into the market and people will make their own choices. And one way you can make choices by spending money. Famously, our Supreme Court has held that money is speech. Disclosure. The holding in Citizens United. Disclosure. The Verge makes money through advertising. Right. (laughs) I'm confident we're a part of whatever, like, GARM initiative. So, like, big platform companies, it's hard to hold them to account. So the advert, it's like crazy that Unilever can't roll up to Meta and be like, don't put our ads next to racism. And Meta's like, yeah, I don't know. We'll take it. We'll, We'll, like, have another meeting. So they form these trade organizations to be like, hey, together we have enough power in the market to make you build the tools so ads don't show up next to racism. <laughs> That's like that is the thing that is happening here. And underlying all of this is this, and I'll just say it. It's like the Jim Jordan committee and the Elon Musk and the Lindy Acarino, they're like, we should be able to do racism. Yep. And like and you can't. You should you should put the money near the racism. Well, no, they're but, no, mad they're, that you don't. They're mad that these companies won't do it. No, there's the, yes, they want to do that, but they also think they deserve money for it. And what you're drawing the distinction on is X has every right to operate its platform in the same yep. way that Garm has every right to tell its clients this is what we think and these are the platforms you think we should we think you should spend right. on, and et cetera. Until we got to this extremely weird point in American history where people are like, what if, what if racism? Like, what if, what if we did some more racism? This is a, it's a weird moment. Up until recently, a thing like Garm that was like, we know these platforms are open and anyone can post whatever they want, but we want the advert, like we, they're very relevant for the advertisers. So we want all the platforms, the advertisers to come together in a committee and have boring meetings and talk about brand safety guidelines. And then we'll all make money together. Like that is, I don't know if anyone, like probably a lot of our listeners have been to like marketing conventions. Like I've been, I've talked to a lot of advertisers in my time. Like they're the money. They're very boring and safe. Like advertisers do not want to be near a bunch of Nazi stuff. So they're like, we're going to go work with the platforms and we're going to build these guidelines. And Twitter was in it. And what you're finding out now is like Twitter doesn't want to offer those controls. The owner keeps tweeting weird racist stuff, which makes the platform seem not safe, and then boosting his own reach. Yeah. Like you don't have to spend money next to that. And it's you know they filed it in this in Texas where they're going to get a favorable judge. I'm sure they're going to get some weird favorable ruling. But eventually you're going to have to contend with the idea that not spending money somehow harms the free speech of racists on Twitter. <laughs> and like, I don't think you can get that far. I think you can force a lot of people to spend a lot of money defending that action. I think you can scare a lot of advertisers the way that people have scared Bud Light, right? You can scare the World Federation of uh, Advertisers, the trade organization, into dissolving GARM, uh, which is two people in a conference room, and they just, <laughs> they're, they're done with it now for Their a while. Slack room is closed. You can do a bunch of weird, threatening stuff, but at the end of the day, the thing you are arguing for is platforms should have racism on them, and advertisers should be okay putting their ads next to that racism. And if you don't offer those controls, you still have to spend the money. And if you don't, it's like a problem. Uh, right under this, I would say, um, under this, notably, Rumble also filed an antitrust lawsuit 
alleging that Garm. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're trying to get other people to do it, and the only ones who want to do it are the ones who want to do racism and are mad that nobody will fund their racism. I would just point out that Twitter, before all of this, was not like Disneyland. Yeah. <laughs> was, there was some racism. On- YouTube makes a lot of money. There's a lot of weird shit on YouTube. Uh, Meta, uh, notable provider of Facebook to old people. Weird. Shrimp Jesus all over all over Facebook today. <laughs> right? Like, they're, the money's still flowing in because they're playing the game in the market. And Mark Zuckerberg is like, you know, he, he might be cozying up to Peter Thiel and saying Donald Trump is a badass, but his public persona is like, I grew up my hair and I'm drinking a beer on a surfboard. We should all make money together. And that's more or less all you need to do. Not Elon Musk sit at the DealBook conference with Andrew Ross Sorkin and tell Bob Iger to go fuck himself and say, you can't bribe me with money. And now he's like, wait, you're not spending the money. I'm going to sue you. Exactly. And that's what that's what this is totally about is it's a denial on Elon's part that he has been self-destructive. He has been destructive to X's business and he wants to blame everyone but himself. I think that's ultimately what this comes down to. He's just a litigious bully. He's just like, how can I bully people? legally he's done it plenty of times before this isn't the first time he's done it this is probably just one of the stupidest times he's done it like you know okay so that's like on the on the top level yeah it's done right you it, you don't have a constitutional duty to spend money you just don't <laughs> so um, stupid. then there's the lawsuit itself and i don't like i don't want to pull it's it's done they, he didn't even get his usual lawyers to file it he had to go get other lawyers like quinn emmanuel his usual law firm is not this oh, they aren't? Uh-huh. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. This is like a real rando. <laughs> yeah, to get someone else to do it. In classic Elon Musk fashion, this complaint centers around a contract that doesn't exist. He we just love loves to find contracts that don't exist. So uh, you will recall um, when he sued OpenAI, it was for a contract that didn't exist. He has withdrawn that lawsuit. He refiled it in federal court recently, and now he's claiming it's fraud. There's, he took out the contract claims. Because he realized you can't sue over a contract that doesn't exist. In this case, he's saying there's antitrust, there's collusion. And the way he finds it is by inventing an enforceable contract with this ad trade organization. And he has to go find it somewhere. He has to say that it's a contract and it's enforceable. And it doesn't exist. Like, there's no penalty if Unilever spends the money. Like, they might get an angry call from someone. But, like, there's no penalty because there's no contract. So he says the agreement by and among GARM's advertiser and advertising agency members to enforce brand safety standards is memorialized in a number of places other than the FAQ and the charter. So if you're <laughs> like, this contract is in an FAQ, you're already on your bed. You're, you're wrong. And you're like looking at other places. And then it says, for example, in new member applications, GARM explains that members must agree to work with industry partners and category peers in a collaborative, non-competitive way. That's the application. <laughs> There's no contract. So you have this like big collusion and underlying it is nothing. And it, I'm telling you, this is just there to threaten people. And then there's a devastating, what can only be described as a devastating cell phone. The advertising boycott of Twitter, now X, is contrary to the economic self-interest of the boycotting advertisers. Due to the boycott of Twitter, prices charged for advertising declined substantially in November 2022 (laughs) and remain well below those charged by X's closest competitors in social media. By refraining from purchasing advertising on X, boycotting advertisers are foregoing a valuable opportunity to purchase low-priced advertising. (laughs) This just sounds like an ad for X advertising. Well, also, that's hilarious. It's also hilarious that Linda posted this video on X where the advertising Advertisers she's trying to talk to are not there. They're purposely yeah. not there. Well, she was she was there saying it's your voices, right? Like yeah. she was calling on the I, the users to effectively attack. Yeah, yeah. All of these folks. So there's that's like, good. and that's like the Bud Light moment, right? Like we're yeah. mad at Unilever. Right, go weirdos. Yeah. And like, I, I I personally think there's a lot on the other side of this lawsuit is a lot of powerful advertising money, and they're gonna say. Actually, we don't think your platform is brand safe, and it is our money is our speech, and we can do whatever we want. And there's there's no contract here saying we can't do these things. There's a trade organization that we rely on so that we all act in a collective way to prevent the monetization of racism, and that's fine. And I, it's really hard to gin up a lot of outrage over that. It's we'll a really see. strange concept that 
you know, it's like Linda is asking users to be mad that they're not getting advertisements from specific companies. Like, I don't yeah. think anyone's ever been mad to not get that. <laughs> yeah, you need to be furious. The Charmin bear is not in your feed right now. God. Is yeah. what she's saying. It's yeah, just th- goofy. Uh, it's also funny that they've gone X premium. They're now advertising. It has no ads. <laughs> because <laughs> you don't it's because you don't have any ads. <laughs> alex how longer how much longer do you think this iteration of x has to go like to uh, be clear it is popping off during the election because right? in election year there's a lot of activity yeah. on the platform there's a lot of people coming to threads because elon keeps posting insane nonsense but it's it's still vibrant in its way is it going to be able to sustain itself over time i think it's very hard for a platform with this level of scale and network effects uh, in social media to just die quickly. I think it's like we're talking like or Elon pulls the plug, right? Elon could have a episode and decide to fully pull the plug or sell it for parts. But barring that, I think it continues to live on. Uh, it dwindles in influence. If I had to guess, their percentage of users who are regular regularly posting has gone way down uh, based on just scanning it. Um, like my the, my feed is just a lot of the same accounts now. It's just less less interesting, less varied, um, but it still has that twitchiness. It's still and for oddly, like in the tech community, the AI world especially, it's just still where everyone is is and hanging out and like the open AI, <laughs> the open AI people are like they're just feeding training data to Grok every day. <laughs> um, it kind of blows my mind, but. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, Threads doesn't quite have that kind of um, real-time juice and, uh, uh, it's like, yeah, it just it's well, missing I mean, it's that It's going to tell us about the lawsuit next week. Don't worry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll find out about it last week or next week. Um, I think, you know, he's betting big on payments. I think we're going to see that relatively soon, this whole banking play uh, where you can – uh, exchange value with other uh, Nazi supporters on the platform. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that's. You know, he's. I think they're building that stack from scratch. I would hope so because I could imagine Stripe turning that off after a while when you realize like what's happening with that. Um, but yeah, it's kind of just turning into this like it's a reflection of Elon. It's a reflection of his psyche. Um, it reminds me a lot of like Rupert Murdoch and Fox, um, and especially how he's using it in this election cycle. It's in stark contrast to Meta and Zuckerberg. Um, yes, you've got Zuckerberg on the edges with the Trump stuff, but Meta is like we're out of politics. We're we're well, not think, we're not recommending it even right. And so it's just very different. Is Murdoch is successful with Fox. <laughs> Fox is like the most successful news network, yeah. and and he he's really good at it, but. Elon's not. He's well. He's I think team. X will start to look more like that. I think it becomes his media empire. Yeah, it's, it's, it's. I mean, it's already become that, right? Right. Like, it's already become his place where he can go and spout the most transphobic, racist stuff imaginable, and not get yelled at, and then sue people because they don't want to advertise next to that transphobic, racist shit. It's just very. He's a free speech absolutist. Well, yeah. Be very clear uh, about this. And that's Sorry. that's the thing. Like he said, we need the <laughs> the internet needs its digital town square, and that's what X was going to be. And it turns out like no one wants to be hanging out with a bunch of people yelling crazy, insulting, yeah. uh, vile. It turns out digital Times Square sucks. Yeah, Times Square is like you never want to be there uh, unless you're (laughs) a tourist and you got conned into a a guide thing there. So, like, yeah, I I feel like it's just reflecting him more and more. And that's going to make it smaller, but it will will live on. I think it stokes his ego. And I think he likes having a platform that has a media element to it that also feeds his other businesses. Which gets acquired by the other one first, Truth Social or X? (laughs) I just summoned that. I'm sorry. I feel like after we got to wrap this up, (laughs) we're already way over. We got a whole lightning round, but uh, I feel like that that is like a supernova of garbage. (laughs) Um, That after this election, we will see. Right? Those things will collide into each other after this election. Um, But yeah, there's just a there's a moment happening here where it feels like. Whatever platform we've talked about this so much on the show. Whatever platform era we are in, with big search in Google, with Twitter dominating public discourse, with Instagram being where all the influencers are, like all of that is just sort of winding down. Like people are tired of a lot of it, <laughs> and like we'll see what happens next. But you can you can feel it. Like oh, a bunch of stuff that we took for granted is changing, and one of them in particular is the dominance of Twitter and the 
conversation because he's just tearing it to shreds. I will end by reminding everyone you do not have a constitutional duty to buy advertising. <laughs> I don't like I, it's not, you know, like, I don't know if I can make this argument to Clarence Thomas. Like George Washington never said that out loud. You know, it's like except if you not, have a lightning pun with your business and you are going to sponsor the lightning round, then you have a yes, constitutional yeah, only duty. Only reason, only reason. Yeah, that's true. George Washington did say that. All right, we got to take a break. <laughs> we'll be right back with the lightning round. <laughs> All right, we're back. Uh, and it's true that the lightning round is once again unsponsored. Um, and I, I believe most of our founding fathers should be disappointed in you. We're talking to lawyers right now. Yeah. The <laughs> lawsuits gonna, are coming. We're going to sue every Vergecast listener for not sponsoring <laughs> the lightning round. Uh, this is good. We, we have, there's just like a lot in lightning round. Kranz, let's just start with Disney real quick because all that's really happening here is they figured out that the way that you make money in streaming is by raising prices. They did. Yeah, Disney is doing fine. They, they figured out that it does cost money to, to put content out on the internet and, and, and that in order to get that money back, you have to increase prices. And they're also, for some reason, kind of copying Peacock and Paramount, even though they are famously not very as popular. By adding in like ABC News is now going to be live. You'll be able to watch ABC oh, sure. just on Disney Plus, and I'm like, that's really smart. I'm really excited about that as someone who doesn't pay for cable. But yeah, Disney's just jacking the prices up, and it's going to keep happening. I'm sorry, folks. So I, I and they're going to do uh, they're cracking down on password sharing uh, in yeah. September. I, so I, they, I they've just figured it out. They're like, hey, yeah. we're going to charge everyone a lot of money. Yeah, like like everybody knows the, exactly what to do, which is make everybody pay you a lot of money for things which is what they were all doing before streaming and they're just like oh my god what if we did what we did with cable but yeah. now we can it turns out there is a constitutional duty to pay a lot of money for disney yeah it, that, that's, that's just baked into the fabric of america there, there's it's, i i still wait with bated breath for the 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 lawsuit um or the antitrust suit against disney for just buying all of pop culture <laughs> and owning all of it except for like Taylor Swift. Hey, I'm gonna go see the Wolverine movie tomorrow. Don't. It's our, we're close to spoilers already. I, I don't want to spoil. It, I don't want to spoil it. But it is the entire Disney oeuvre is like in that movie. All right. Uh, so that's, that's Disney. <laughs> um, Lauren, what's your lightning round? Yeah. So I've got um, Microsoft and Delta just going at each other for <laughs> you know who who was the issue with Delta having to cancel a bunch of flights after the crowd strike issue. And this whole story is basically the Spider-Man meme. Um, <laughs> they're just pointing at each other. Uh, and it seems like maybe Delta Delta CEO missed an email from Satya Nadella um, offering help. And so- It's very good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just a lot it's, of really mundane things like missing emails, except that. Well, Delta <laughs> Wi-Fi does suck, so I'm not it's surprised. It's really bad. I'm not surprised that he missed an email. He's probably on one of his planes. Yeah. <laughs> Delta yeah, Wi-Fi is horrible, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, it seemed like maybe the CEO was, like, flying to the Olympics. Um, oh, so, God. yeah, it, it definitely could be could be the Delta Wi-Fi. Um, so CrowdStrike went down, uh, Delta went down catastrophically, and then Ed Bastian, who's the CEO of Delta, was on CNBC, and he said, when was the last time you heard of a big outage at Apple, which apparently just made everyone mad, like everyone got mad, except for Apple. I think Apple is thrilled to hear that. Um, and so Microsoft sent this letter, and they're like, our software didn't cause your problem. CrowdStrike did. And CrowdStrike is kind of like, don't worry, can you guys fight? <laughs> yeah. It's all very good. Um, uh, and they keep saying they've been offering to help Delta. Delta apparently had it worse. Like, other airlines came back faster. Yeah, so Delta not... was, like, days later. They were canceling, f like, they just canceled their um, unaccompanied minor program during oh, wow. all of this. They were like, uh, yeah, minors, you just don't travel anymore. And so kids were, like, stranded in random airports and stuff. They shit the bed and and are looking for someone to blame yeah, so Microsoft is saying uh, Delta has apparently not modernized its IT infrastructure, and that's it is rapidly becoming apparent that Delta likely refused Microsoft's help because the IT system it was having most trouble restoring, crew tracking and scheduling, was being serviced by other providers such as IPMs. <laughs> and it's <laughs> like, I've never seen an IT vendor look at a client and be like, no, 
This no, you. absolutely not. This well, didn't South, wasn't Southwest not impacted because they were still running on like such an old version of Windows? No, that's a meme. That's right up oh. there with JD Vance and the couch. It's like, it's so good. You don't want to check it, you know? Wait, JD Vance and the couch isn't real? <laughs> yeah. Damn it. It's like, it's, it's like, there's a long list of too good to check and Southwest wasn't affected because it's running on like Windows 3 is like right up there. <laughs> you just ruined my week. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's fine. Southwest is great. Um, all right, Alex, what's yours? Uh, Heath, what's your lightning round? Yeah, so mine is a great scoop that Kylie had on the site about Humane, a company that we obviously have been obsessively chronicling since the disastrous debut of its AI pin. Uh, she found out, based on some internal sales data, that she got that more pins are being returned <laughs> than sold. It's very good. Which <laughs> I'm not running a hardware business, but I think that's bad. Yeah. And um, the piece is great. She's got a lot of color. Um, I just want to call out Humane spokesperson Zoe's uh statement to us, where she said, uh, we do not comment on financial data, but we'll refer it to our legal counsel. Okay. Um, and um, it's yeah. just ridiculous. It's a ridiculous response I to a story like this. But um, Humane is very much on the defensive. Uh, there's talks, rumors of them, you know, trying to sell themselves to HP. They raised over $200 million and sold $9 million worth of product-ish. So not good for them. And it, wait, um, if you do the math at $9 million, at whatever, the, the pin was 700 bucks. So they sold yeah. like 12,000 units. They and, wanted to sell 100,000 in the first right. year. So they sold like 12,000. And I think Kylie has it. There's only 7,000 left in the wild. Yeah. Yeah. That's bad. Who, That's just generally bad. But if you have those, one, you should save it and put it in a box. It's going to be a great, honestly, it'll be a great collector's if item. If you have one and haven't returned it and actually use it, just just hit me up. I want to mm. know everything about you. I want to yeah. understand your world. And someone you right now, someone Shuffer. is touching their pin and being like, email Alex. <laughs> A Alex. Email <laughs> Alex. Nope, no, the pin's on fire. <laughs> uh, oh, that was the other thing, Holly's uh, piece, uh, which I think is one of the worst pieces of the puzzle they haven't figured out how to refurbish the pins yeah because yeah. some limitation with t-mobile which i'm guessing is related to reprovisioning the eSIM inside the pin so they're just stuck with this and they hope they can figure it out um we just bad all around i will say to uh, to heath's point once you tell once you start waving lawyers at me i've learned something about you yeah 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 i'm not gonna it's say the what. ultimate tell it's yeah, it's just song. like it's like oh oh I, I know something and we we do this a lot. People have, a lot of lawyers have emailed me. The Verge still exists. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> we're uh, we're better at it than you might think. Uh, all right, um, I'm gonna talk. Can I can I quickly talk about the TV competition? Tell <laughs> us about every a story that I didn't write. A thing that no one knows that I did. Um, there's a very famous TV store in Westchester, New York, called Value Electronics. They've been doing it forever. They sell a million TVs. Robert Zahn, the guy who owns it, he runs it with his family. It's a, just a little mom and pop. And they sell more high-end TVs than anyone. Like Sony allocates high-end TVs to this one store. And so every year they run, uh, and he's a former broadcast engineer. So every year they run this thing called the TV shootout. They've been doing it for 20 years. And like literally like comp the CEO of compression houses and like the head colorist for movie studios, like, a Warner Brothers Discovery encoding person is like, they're the judges. They have master calibrators come and calibrate all these TVs. Beautiful. And then there was me, because I'm a consumer reviewer. Um, <laughs> which is great. So I was like honored to do this. I felt completely out of my depth. Um, I think my scores were in line with everyone else. And I will write this up over the weekend. But I will say, one, my, my TV, the one I bought, the Sony A95, it won. Yay! Congratulations! Oh, oh, that was the winner. Uh, and then the Mini LED TVs, I think I said micro LED earlier, but the mini LED TVs, the new Bravia 9, um, there's a Samsung one, there's an LG one, they're not even in the running yet. You can just obviously tell, like, they're going to get there, but there's so much more to go on the mini LED side before they compete with the OLEDs. Ugh. The OLEDs are just like, it was like a, a sigh of relief going and looking at the OLEDs after the mini LEDs. That... So I will write all this up, but it was fascinating to be a judge in a TV picture quality con. Like, uh, first of all, I was in heaven, like pure heaven, just joy for two days. I did nothing but look at TVs with other TV nerds oh. and talk about things like posterization in like fields of color. Did people, who who brought the like colorimeter? Did anybody bust it out? Uh, the So that we were, 
I had to write about this. But we were <laughs> judging the TV. It wasn't a subjective okay. uh, evaluation. They had $40,000 Sony reference monitors yes. by each bank of three TVs. Oh, my God. And the, the judging was how much the TVs were deviation, how big of a deviation from the reference monitor those TVs were. Oh, so, of course, the Sony one. Right, because it was a Sony <laughs> reference monitor. It's like, does the Sony look like its own Sony reference monitor? But the, the reference monitors were like, this is what the mastering people wanted the movie to look like or wanted the content to look like. And then if you calibrate the TVs, how closely can you calibrate the TV to the reference? This is what I so want. It's not like a what looks better, totally subjective thing. It was how close is this to the reference, which made it like a very different kind of exercise. And then obviously everyone's like a huge nerd. Like people were up there like staring at pixels and like intently. And we had to be reminded the judges were like, you can't collude. (laughs) <laughs> Again, I was like, purely in heaven. No antitrust uh, for here. For two days over a weekend. How many times you. did you have to watch Harry Potter? Or like? Avatar. Oh, man. Uh, so we watched a movie called Doctor Sleep several times, which mm. is insane. So you had to find things. like We were judging things like uh, low light performance. Or right. Fast SDR motion or like bright high HDR sports. So they had to find clips to play. All of the clips were being run off an Oppo uh, Blu-ray player. I'm so Oxo happy. Thought of you, or off, <laughs> or off a Kaleidoscape, which is really high bitrate. Yeah. Um, streaming. Um, so all the, there were all these like specific clips that were there to show uh, like specific things that we were to judge, and I had like sixty numbers per sheet, and there were like four sheets of scores, <laughs> and it was it was a ten point scale, and I was like. World of No Sevens, like the whole thing. <laughs> it was great. Uh, the Sony, you can go look at the press release. You can see the scores. Uh, the Sony won. The LG G4 came in second, more or less, um, and the Samsung came in third in the OLEDs, and then the, the Mini Sony Mini LED came in first in Mini LEDs. Um, so the scores are public. I'm not revealing anything. You can just go look at that press release. I will write up the whole thing because there's more to say. Um, but I have to say, like, I thought I was going to spend this week arguing about TV stuff with people. And I super did it. <laughs> I was very much distracted by other stuff. Uh, but I had the time of my life. It was really fun to be a judge. I hope I get to do it again next year. Um, and, yeah, I'm like, I, I, and I, the interesting thing is that the headroom for those mini LEDs to get as good as OLEDs is obvious, but it's, it's nowhere close. Like, yeah. not even in the same ballpark. Yet. Was it the brightness and just like that, that, that difference in... The no, it's like it's color. I mean, they're LCD TVs. Yeah. So they're still they're they're like washed out. The colors are all wrong. Like the mm-hmm. LCDs are all pinker than the OLEDs. Uh, it's it's like bananas. Um, I will post up my scores, like my my score sheets. There's lots I was like, of like Neil, I just want you to file notes. this story. I just really want to read this I, story. That's what now. I thought I was going to do yeah. this weekend. I just had to read PDFs all day long. Please, oh. no one else release a major. I started lawsuit. in this whole career to not be a lawyer and to look at TVs all day long. <laughs> no more lawsuits. <laughs> We're done for the week. Also, yeah. justice for the frame TV. I'm really sad. The frame TV was not even in the picture. Like, uh, I brought up the frame TV with a bunch of people. Oh, uh, uh, the manufacturers all had representatives there. So I met a bunch of very nice, like, Sony engineers and product managers and all the companies were there. And I kept asking, like, do you think the frame TV is a harbinger of doom? And they'd be like, no, no comment. I don't. Who are you? Are you a professional <laughs> color calibrator? <laughs> well, they're, they're, we got more of them now. We, yeah, there's, there's a competition for the frame TV from... Who is it? Is it it's Hisense? TCL and Hisense. So, uh, like, a uh, race to the bottom yeah. on TV quality there. It's, no it's disrespect. A real, it's a real something. TCL and Hisense, by the way, uh, opted out of the competition. They declined mm. to participate, mm. which is pretty good. Uh, all right, Kranz, what's your lightning round? All right. So, my, my lightning round is Chromecast is dead, but Chromecast is not dead. Just the dongle is dead. I, I saw there was some confusion out there in the world. Chromecast is like the protocol that you can go and like cast things to your TV or whatever. That still lives. The little dongles are gone. They're done. It's all over. It's They're all the, over. The picture we have in our Chromecast is gone is a picture I took of the first generation <laughs> Chromecast in 2013. Plugged into my Pioneer Kuro. And in the background, you can see my three component cables plugged into it because it was 10 years ago. Component pretty, rule. Pretty sure my cable box is plugged in with RCA cables <laughs> via component. It's very good. It's very uh, good. It's kind of it, you know the Google's whole idea with the Chromecast was you, you you're just going to use your phone to watch video and send it to a TV. And we all realized that sucked. Yeah, it didn't work. And then the TVs all have the software in it. And the new streamer box 
Alex, I'm very curious for your perspective on this. They told Chris Welch that their North Star, what they were competing with, is the NVIDIA Shield. Yeah. I mean, look, we love to rip on the NVIDIA Shield. I personally still use the Apple TV myself. But the NVIDIA Shield is the most powerful set-top box. It is the highest quality. It is the one that, like, if they had been using a streaming box at the shootout and Eli went to... That's what they would have been using. They it, use it's, Apple TV. I just want yeah. to be very clear about that. But this. Apple TV is, that's the one that installers <laughs> all like to use because that's what the clients would prefer. Yes. So those are two, like the two. So like chasing the NVIDIA Shield is awesome. The NVIDIA Shield could probably do to chase itself a little because I don't think it's had an update in like two years. But it's like, it I also think NVIDIA is like, has different priorities now. Yeah, right now they're like, we're just going to like generate buckets of money with AI. We don't care about these little. If we ever anymore. interview Jensen Wang and Decoder, I'm going to be like, Jensen Wang. If we ever Wong. interview Jensen Wang and Decoder, I'm going to be like, AI, whatever. Tell me about your plans for the NVIDIA issue. <laughs> and we're going to see if he even knows it exists. <laughs> He's just going to be like, pocket sand, throw it at you and like, disappear <laughs> out of frame. Just absolutely not. Just run away. Oh, Alex, I got to tell you, uh, one of the tests we did at the TV shootout uh, was an ATSC 3.0. We watched the yes. Olympics broadcast from NBC New York in 1080p HDR. Uh, to something called the Zapper Box, like a tuner box uh, with Atmos audio. It was like ba ba like barely compressed because it was just full quality broadcast. It looked incredible. Yeah. And I was like, I got to get an antenna. And then I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> you don't need one. I truly do not have to get an antenna. That's the only station and, and you, won't get, you won't get any joy out of it once the Olympics are over. Uh, there was a very funny mis like miscommunication moment where I was like, where is this coming from? And someone very earnestly was like, it's in Paris. And I was like, no, that's not what I meant at all. Bonjour. <laughs> I was like, no, I meant what station it's brought. Fine, whatever. Uh, it was very good. All right, we are way over. I'm sorry that we talked about Elon Musk, but he's not good at knowing what a contract is. I'm just telling you that's the truth. Uh, Lauren, Heath, thanks so much for joining us. This was great. Thanks for having us. Uh, I think David Pierce is back next week. We'll see if the show gets back. back. We'll see if the show gets back on the rest. <laughs> it won't. <laughs> We're going to be too busy suing people. each other. Uh, all right, that's it. That's our chest. Bye. And that's it for the Vergecast this week. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Give us a call at 866-VERGE-11. The Vergecast is a production of The Verge and Vox Media Podcast Network. Our show is produced by Andrew Marino and Liam James. That's it. We'll see you next week. <laughs>